Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Advanced Methods webinar series. It's my pleasure to introduce our presentation for today, Identification of Algorithms and Related Considerations When Using Administrative Data for Epidemiology. Uh, by way of introduction, I'd like to present Scott Emerson. He's an epidemiologist within the Epidemiology and Population Health Program of the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS. He completed his MSc in Epidemiology at UBC School of Population and Public Health. And during his graduate training, Scott gained experience in understanding, managing, and analyzing administrative healthcare data, as well as their multi-source linkage with survey, educational, and immigration data. His master's thesis focused on generating and evaluating the validity evidence for a quality of life measure and was supported by a Tri-Council Canada graduate scholarship. Scott's prior experience includes analytic epidemiological roles at ICES and UBC's Human Learning Partnership. His current role, in his current role, Scott supports various initiatives focused on education and capacity building in the application of linked administrative healthcare data for epidemiology. And uh, I'd like to thank Scott very much for presenting today. I know his topic is of a lot of interest to, uh, to our network. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Scott. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, as, as mentioned, uh, the topic uh, today I'll be discussing is uh, identification algorithms and related considerations in using administrative data for epidemiology. Um, so I, I think it'll cover a few different areas and sort of range in scope from quite technical sort of details in some places to more higher level conceptual uh, and sort of implications. So hopefully um, there's something for you know, a wide uh, variety of, of people listening. Uh, firstly, I want to uh, respectfully acknowledge that I'm presenting from the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, uh, which is present day Vancouver. Uh, I also have a data acknowledgement um, just to declare that any inferences uh, that may be made or, or implied, as well as opinions or conclusions drawn from this presentation are those of um, myself, the author, and don't re reflect the opinions or policies of the data stewards. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to uh, another webinar in this um, sort of webinar series, obviously by uh, Pop Data, uh, that was given a few years ago uh, by a colleague of mine, Taylor McClendon. And I think this serves as a nice complement to uh, the topic and information that will be discussed today. Uh, so you can search up this uh, link and, and this uh, webinar titled Measurement in Administrative Health Data, Case Definitions, Algorithms and Validation Studies. I think it provides a very uh, accessible uh, and sort of informative introduction to administrative data and measurement considerations generally. So I, I'd encourage people to take a look, particularly if you're interested in the, the sort of things that we will be talked about today, uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, as Anne briefly mentioned, um, I'd just like to present a little bit of context for my background. Um, I think this can help sort of situate and, and give perspective to uh, the lens that I uh, approach administrative data from, uh, which may be a little bit different than other people. Um, so my educational background uh, includes a master's from UBC School of Population and Public Health. Uh, where my thesis focused on uh, assessing validity to evidence of a quality of life measure. But in that time, I was also involved with several other uh, projects that used administrative data linkages, uh, all of which were provided by uh, or hosted by Pop Data BC. And then um, that work with Pop Data BC's holdings continued on as I worked at uh, UBC's Human Early Learning Partnership, which is a child health research institute. Uh, so in that time, various projects that I, I worked on supported used uh, linkage between administrative health as well as um, non-health uh, data linkages. So things like educational records and immigration data. Uh, and thereafter, I then uh, worked as an epidemiology epidemiologist at ICS when I was uh, living in Toronto. And in this role, I was um, situated across a few different programs and got really useful experience uh, in uh, using administrative data and uh, across a variety of different uh, clinical areas. So along those lines of, of the different topics and different disease areas, uh, what's presented here is uh, a variety of different studies that I've been involved with. 
Um, so you can see that they span uh, various different uh, disease indications, different populations, and use different types of administrative health data. So on the left-hand side, uh, what's shown here are more, I suppose, perhaps more traditional types of analyses or, or linkages where they are in a linkage um, from one health uh, data set or health survey to another. Whereas on the right-hand side, these studies um, ha have linkage to more educational uh, sources of information. So uh, educational record for achievement and things like that, as well as cross-sectional surveys and information from government sources on immigration and immigration related factors. So this is just, a, a, I guess, a reminder and um, sort of unveiling to people that there are a variety of different administrative data linkages possible. And I think increasingly um, there's an interest in using sort of health administrative uh, administrative health data to non-health uh, data sources as sort of a complement, getting at things like social determinants of health and so on. So in my current role, uh, as, as mentioned briefly by Anne, I work uh, as an epidemiologist at the BC Centre for Excellence in HIV AIDS. In this role, I provide uh, consulting, educational analytic support to a variety of different projects, all sort of centred on using administrative health data. I also lead a monthly um, educational and resource capacity building presentation series called the Administrative Data Working Group. And uh, in those groups, we cover similar topics to what will be discussed today, sort of methodological considerations, data quality, uh, decision uh, points and justification, pros and cons of different approaches, all the sort of the nuances and um, details of, of using administrative data for research purposes. Uh, at the centre, we have a, a variety of different um, holdings available across um, a few different uh, data linkage projects. Uh, but one I want to draw uh, people's attention to, particularly for those uh, who may be joining from Ontario, is that uh, there a commonly used uh, data source in administrative health data in BC is called MSP, the Medical Services Plan. So this is uh, healthcare practitioner billing. So, but it is comparable to OHIP in Ontario. So when you see MSP throughout this presentation, you can try to associate that with OHIP. So this is information on you know, physician billings and other healthcare provider billings, uh, as well as other types of billing information. So in addition to these sort of uh, health administrative data holdings, we also have linkage to other uh, sort of in-house clinical uh, treatments, such as demographic, as well as survey holdings uh, from the Centre of Excellence here. So with that sort of context laid, uh, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the sort of the topics and an outline of what will be discussed today. Uh, so first I'll, I'll sort of lay a foundation of why it can be useful to transform or modify administrative health data. Uh, and when it maybe it isn't necessary to do so, and what aspects should like should be considered to be modified or not, and then moving on to that sort of uh, applied with the idea of when it's useful to modify administrative health data, I'll talk about identification algorithms, uh, which can be applied to sort of derive a bit more information, more useful information from administrative health data, and discuss different subtypes within that sort of broad umbrella term, and then discussing uh, sort of once you have these identification algorithms and want to apply them, um, it's useful to know the, the sort of the, the meaningfulness of these algorithms and when it can be valid in different contexts uh, and sort of how to assess the validity and, and what aspects could be perhaps more important to consider depending on your context and you know, lots of little nuances within that. And then to finish, I'll discuss uh, some suggestions for reporting and applying and implementing algorithms, as well as sort of reporting and describing the results, uh, as well as sort of broader implications of using uh, administrative uh, data algorithms. So moving on, the first sort of topic that I'll discuss is about administrative health data and why it can be useful to transform it. Before doing that, I just want to draw your attention to uh, terminology. I think this is a useful place to start. Um, I, when I sort of first got exposed to this area, I was sort of um, curious about different terms that people would use uh, for these records. So administrative health data or health administrative data are two, I'd say, probably the most commonly used terms, but there's a variety of different other uh, terms to, to describe these uh, types of data. You can see listed here. Uh, real world evidence is one that um, perhaps more used in, in sort of industry and private sector. Uh, but just to give you an idea, these are different terms that can be used. So if you're trying to search into the literature or read reports, there may be different uh, terms that are used to describe these uh, types of study. But all to say, I would, I would describe any health-related data that's in some administrative form, i.e. 
not designed or collected purely for primary research purposes, uh, but rather it's collected primarily for financial, budgeting, administrative reasons. Uh, I would describe those to be administrative health data. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, linkage between administrative health data to um, administrative sort of educational records and other government records and information such as social services, the physical and social environment, education records and census. Um, this is a way to enrich or, or complement the existing information from uh, administrative health data. With uh, lots of things in, in research and, and in the data worlds, um, there are sort of clear pros and cons to using administrative health data. So there are these trade-offs that can be considered. Um, and I think it's rather than um, using it to you know, lament the, the poor quality of administrative data or like the, the challenges are so great, it's useful to consider a balanced approach. So I see sort of one main strength of administrative data being the strong uh, representation. So this is particularly the case in the, in the Canadian setting and such as provinces. So you're able to capture or represent like an entire province or region like fairly well, um, which is you know, quite unique and something that would be you know, much more expensive or perhaps not feasible to do with other modes of information, like more traditional research methods such as surveys or interviews. Uh, and connected to that, you can also consider um, sort of a large range of look back or look forward dates like after your index date. Uh, which is very useful as well because that's again something that may not be feasible or would be like very expensive to do if you were uh, conducting primary data collection but those strengths come at the sort of the cost of um sort of i guess accuracy and and the usefulness from a clinical depth perspective so um although with administrative health data you can assume uh, you, people often assume that there is some uh, event or uh, disease occurring but ultimately it is um, lacking some detailed or specific information about symptomology or condition. You just know that someone recorded healthcare use for a certain condition. And related to that, you rely on ICD-based um, case definitions, which can vary in accuracy or have limitations, um, particularly with mental illnesses that can be um, you know, classified in more complex ways. Um, so this is a a limitation as opposed to to bear in mind when you're thinking of working with administrative data. Uh, it's all to say it's, it's useful to know that uh, administrative data has clear strengths um, but also limitations. Uh, An important reminder that um, what you see in administrative health data is just sort of uh, the tip of the iceberg or one aspect that's that's captured and depending on the disease um, it can be like very accurate at capturing that event or um, sort of health behavior but ultimately um, the health or, or someone's health experience or symptoms occurs like far beyond what is only recorded in healthcare encounters. And um, so with these sort of limitations and considerations in mind, uh, it's a useful place to, to move forward from. Uh, on, on the note of sort of some of the limitations, um, the, the, the specific nature of administrative data, which is often in a raw structure and not um, designed for research per se by definition, uh, this can present some challenges and considerations. So there can be errors or cancelled corrected records, particularly in um, MSP or, or uh, health practitioner billing records, where there can be records that are uh, corrected or adjusted or, uh, at a later date. So this is something that needs to be addressed or need to be aware of. There can also be um, mistakes in how information is entered. There could be typos or misdiagnoses or, or values that are entered that um, or provisional or query entries as well. There can be lots of artifacts due to changes in definitions or new fields being sort of added or removed over time, uh, which can you know, artificially uh, sort of skew or impact results if you're not aware of those changes, uh, which is really just an artifact of uh, changes to the data quality and the data structure. And finally, the, the nature and the way that records are structured um, is often from the perspective of billing or research or sorry resource use perspective so there could be redundant rows if someone um, went to see their your family physician and there were say four or five uh, fee items billed then that would show up as four or five different rows but the the reason for a visit was you know a single uh, reason a single diagnostic information so it's important to be aware of those um, subtleties all is to say if you took administrative data at its face value and assumed that uh, they were ready for analysis this can be uh, problematic uh, for uh, in inferences and conclusions and sort of the types of results that would be generated. 
So with that said, um, failure to modify or transform administrative data can introduce biases, not only in the sort of the data and the results that you would uh, glean, but also in the inferences that can be made. And therefore, I suppose this could be called consequential validity. Uh, so in terms of the, the consequences of the actions based on inferences from the data. So some examples uh, of these, which will be unpacked a little bit later on, include um, taking healthcare records with diagnostic codes at face value. Uh, so this can lead to overestimating counts and rates of cases. If you have, uh, if you use like a very crude uh, way of, of assuming someone has uh, a condition or a disease based on information with the diagnostic code without, you know, assuming some validity or exploring that and using sort of a validated algorithm or, or, you, or testing that algorithm yourself that can lead to sort of inflating counts and rates of cases or indeed other health events. A second example is uh, if you treated transfer related hospitalization records a separate hospitalization so this is if someone was admitted to hospital A and then transferred to hospital B those would show up as separate records uh, but really, um, for, for some purposes, they could be considered as two sort of components or pieces within a broader episode of care. So if you treated them in their raw form, that could lead to overestimating hospitalization counts and rates, as well as underestimating hospitalization length of stay. And a final example, which is BC specific, as far as I'm aware, but it uh, could be applicable to other provinces. Uh, this is if you used a single source of emergency department use data without integrating other sources to complement that information. This could lead to underestimating emergency, emergency department use counts and rates. This is because in BC, NACRS, which you may have been familiar with, um, NACRS is used like a, across lots of regions of Canada, but in BC, the, it, it represents probably 70 to 75 percent, the estimate, of all the emergency department use. So if you only used NACRS, uh, even in the last 10 years when it's been available, it would lead to underestimating emergency department use by about 25%. Um, so applying some methodology to integrate different uh, sources of emergency department use is really important uh, in that context. So with that being said, um, it's important generally for, for like a lot of reasons to transform and modify administrative health data and sort of use identification algorithms, which we'll get to. But there's some instances where it's um, not required to transform administrative data, the information there. Uh, and whether you transform or not, or exactly how you, you know, create or apply an algorithm or you know, modify an existing algorithm, it all should depend on your specific uh, project goals and your analysis goals. So there's no um, one size fits all solution. Um, but what I've shown here is an example with hospitalization records where depending on your focus and your, your, your analytic question and your research goal, uh, it could be appropriate to treat the records as they are or else combine them into creating a transfer related uh, like a hospitalization episode of care. So if your goal was to estimate hospital level research use, it could be um, useful to just treat the records as they are since they reflect the focus or the resource use from the hospital's perspective. However, if you were trying to estimate hospitalization rates or uh, hospitalization length of stay, it would probably be more appropriate at least to consider combining uh, these transfer related hospitalization records to create hospitalization episodes of care. So, so closing this section, um, as we discussed sort of the strengths and, uh, and potential challenges, I think um, some people may be sitting here and I've certainly been in this position and, and frequently come back to it thinking, um, you know, I'm not sure about the usefulness of administrative data, so you could have skepticism about sort of the validity evidence supporting using administrative data at all. Uh, but I found this nice quotation, uh, which I, I think summarizes the sort of the points and the, and the sort of a, a balanced approach on using administrative data. So in the article, the author said, however, when these data, referring to administrative health data, are applied to an appropriate question with validated case definitions, high quality and reliable conclusions can be inferred. So moving on to discuss uh, identification algorithms. So this is a specific uh, sort of way that you can modify and transform the administrative health data from their raw form to um, you know, a classification that can be more useful. Uh, there are lots of different terms for uh, and definitions for algorithms. It's you know, quite widely used in um, sort of common language as well as in the research world. But for the purpose of today, um, you can view an algorithm in a broad sense as a set of rules or conditions applied 
to transform data to obtain some desired output or some information. Specifically, uh, I would say it is identification algorithm as it identifies or helps identify some characteristic event or health condition. So this algorithm, the idea of like um, applying some rules or, or, or criteria or, or approach to transforming and, and modifying existing data to get some output and with an identification algorithm specifically, you're able to identify um, you know, a specific event or, or, or in other words, classify uh, information into a more meaningful unit or a uh, you know, form of information. Another definition is listed here, but using a combination of values, since that often is what happens. Um, you're, you're combining, say, diagnostic codes with search windows and other assumptions, and that allows identification of cases or health events. When you, if you're familiar at all with identification algorithms or the idea of algorithms with administrative health data, you probably think of the uh, the idea of a case finding algorithms, also called case definition, case definitions, or uh, case ascertainment algorithms. So these are ways to uh, find or identify cases. So typically they use diagnostic codes and it can identify if a person um, or, or sort of assumes that a person who meets these diagnostic codes within a certain time period and other assumptions that they would be uh, identified as a case, i.e. a person with asthma, diabetes, HIV, or whatever condition it may be. And some jurisdictions actually provide um, uh, sort of lists of these specific case definitions. And these are probably the most commonly uh, sort of thought of uh, form of uh, algorithm with immersive health data. What I've shown here are uh, sort of a handful of examples from the Canadian literature that were fairly recently published. Most of them are in Ontario. Uh, these are examples of the types of conditions that have been uh, or have been that people have tried to capture with administrative health data and the types of inputs uh, or the sort of the, the ingredients of the algorithm that it's used to, to get at that information. So just using the first row as an example, um, this algorithm required people to have at least five physician visits uh, with a MS uh, related diagnostic code recorded and those five physician visits needed to occur within a 24 month window or else having one MS related hospitalization ever. Uh, and typically diagnostic codes uh, within physician visits and hospitalization are like common ingredients, uh, but you can see also um, prescription, like so medication dispensing information, as well as fee codes or like other fee items uh, can be part of these. Uh, algorithm ingredients, but these are sort of a common uh, and like would account for a, a large proportion, I'd say, of all sort of case finding algorithms that you will see. Uh, so, in addition to identifying cases, uh, identification algorithms can also be used to identify other elements of interest, and um, whether this is health or and uh, sort of social determinants of health or other demographic information. So, <clears throat> uh, sort of the two sort of subsets, I would say, within these. Uh, sort of beyond cases uh, types of algorithms. So one would be other health events. So hospitalization episodes of care, which I talked about a little bit earlier, and these can be identified with, with algorithms. And there's, there's like lots of different ways you can construct or link together hospital records that are connected by sort of someone being transferred to one facility to another. And so there are different assumptions and different ways that you can construct an algorithm for that purpose. Uh, another example is emergency department visits, which is a BC specific context. In addition to these health events, there are also some, um, I suppose, less conventional uh, ways of identifying information. Um, so using administrative data, such as from the IRCC, which is the immigration record, you can uh, assign visible minority group membership. Uh, another example is homelessness, where you can use information to try to estimate if someone um, was experiencing homelessness at a certain time. And this is not to say that all these algorithms are are perfect and, and like you know uh, gold standard like watertight measures of the their intended concept, but uh, it's just to give you a bit of an awareness that there are lots of different uh, you know types of information that can be gleaned and more useful information than you know just relying on the raw information per se. Uh, so I've shown here a few examples of different uh, topics and con concepts, uh, health events and characteristics that can be. Um, you no know, gleaned or that there are algorithms that have been uh, tested and been used out there. Uh, so it gives you a bit of a sense of what, what can be uh, what can be done with algorithms beyond solely uh, trying to identify cases. Um, 
along that line, I've, I've listed a few different examples here of studies. So getting at things like procedures, hospitalization episodes, injection drug use. The inputs can be similar to, to the types of inputs that are used for case finding algorithms, but they can also differ a little bit too. Um, so for hospitalization episodes, for instance, like an important aspect is actually the date, so the discharge of admission date, and like the time between someone being discharged from one facility to then admitted to another one is like a really central and important um, consideration in an algorithm, trying to get hospitalization episodes of care. And with homelessness, um, in this example, they they searched like a, quite a large number of different uh, studies and different um, these are data sources, repositories to get information on residential status, postcode, as well as some diagnostic codes, since there are some ICD codes that relate to housing instability and res residential instability generally. Uh, I've shown here a few examples from uh, that homelessness uh, identification algorithm. So uh, you can see that they covered like a wide range of different data sources and really quite a exhaustive search and like all available sources. This is an Ontario context and um, to try and get at if someone um, could be uh, you know, assumed to be homeless or, or having experienced homeless based on the information available in a variety of different data sources. So to end this um, sort of discussion of identification algorithms uh, sort of from a conceptual level, I have this diagram to illustrate the sort of the ideas that we're thinking of. So identification algorithm being a sort of a large umbrella term within which there are different subtypes of algorithms, so case finding, algorithms to identify other health events, and then algorithms to identify other characteristics or events. So with that being said, um, as you can maybe pick up on uh, as, as it's been applied, there are various different nuances or details to consider with identification algorithms related to you know, the inputs or how those inputs are, are used or not used and combined and things like search window and, and timing of events, like all these different considerations. So uh, we're going to dig a little bit more into these uh, details and, and nuances um, as this is something that and you know, it seems minor in some ways, but it's very fundamental, I'd say, in uh, any identification algorithm, and it has quite, um, you know, impactful uh, implications for uh, sort of the results and, and the usefulness of an algorithm. The first sort of set of, of considerations, I would say, would relate to the inputs for identification algorithms. Um, so in the context of case finding, <clears throat> this is often diagnostic codes, or it could be uh, fee items from health practitioner billings or drug identification numbers, lots of different inputs available. Um, and these may differ or they may be similar for other types of algorithms, so hospitalization episodes and other algorithms that are discussed there, but we'll focus in on the example of diagnostic codes with case finding, as that's um, particularly uh, sort of salient and, and an important uh, thing to consider. So the first point I would say is that while diagnostic codes um, come in a variety of different forms, there are, uh, you know, even within the, the system, so like an ICD system, which is commonly used across Canada, there are various different versions that exist. So, for instance, ICD-9, ICD-9-CM, ICD-10-CA, and these evolve over time. Uh, there are also jurisdiction-specific codes. And I believe this is the case in Ontario. Maybe at the end, people can um, you know, share their own experiences. But I, I know in BC, we have some um, sort of non-ICD or non-standard uh, diagnostic codes. So these are codes um, such as 50B here, which is uh, quite widely used for mood and anxiety conditions. Um, but that wouldn't appear in any ICD or sort of official manual or the like sort of standard coding system. But nonetheless, it is uh, you know, important uh, to be considered. Uh, and it's because it is something that's, that's used by uh, practitioners regularly. Uh, another consideration pertains to hospitalization records where the specific type or sort of typing of diagnostic uh, information can matter. And so in a given uh, hospitalization record, there can be up to 25 different diagnostic codes entered. And um, so depending on your purpose, you may wish to consider like any of those codes. If you're searching for, say, uh, a diabetes related hospitalization, if a diabetes code such as 250, if that appeared at any point in, so, in someone's hospital record, then we would classify that as a diabetes related hospital uh, stay. But there are also some more subtlety 
there is a bit more subtlety with the typing. So there's uh, there's a field, for instance, called MRD or most responsible diagnosis, which is the single event or reason that um, uh, that contributed the most to a person's hospital stay. So for some studies, you may be interested just in that rather than any diagnosis. But it's a, it's a, regardless of what you prefer or what's most useful for a, a study project, um, it's useful to consider these uh, in your analysis and your decision-making process, what you include or don't include. Along the lines of diagnostic codes, um, the way that they are structured, there often are sort of codes at a three-digit level, such as 250, which is diabetes related, uh, but there can also be subcodes um, within that. So you can think of 250 as, say, a parent code, and then sort of subcodes such as 2500, 2501. This is just one example, uh, but this is a, a common theme when you're searching for diagnostic codes. It's useful to know, do you want to capture or try to capture all uh, records that had that started with 250 and um, so get those sort of the, the codes within 250 so those that start with 250 and end with various different numbers or if you only want to look for a specific code uh, and this depends on your project focus sometimes the specific code is of interest because um, you might be only interested in a certain subtype within that diagnostic category uh, but from a data quality perspective at least in BC and I assume this is similar in other uh, jurisdictions it can be various data entry errors or billing mistakes or just sort of artifacts of the software that's used to enter diagnostic codes. So this can lead to um, trailing zeros being added or leading zeros being added, uh, which is particularly the case with practitioner billing records. So something to be aware of as that could impact uh, sort of the, the number of records that are used for inputs and algorithms if you are sort of more specific or more sensitive in your approach of uh, including diagnostic codes and how you query them in uh, code. Another point is that um, the nature or setting of the health event can matter. So with MSP and OHIP, for instance, uh, these are health practitioner billings. People often refer to them as physician billings or perhaps more specifically outpatient physician billings, but they actually contain information um, from non-physicians, so other healthcare providers such as uh, uh, nurses and nurse practitioners as well as uh, care that's provided in various different settings. So in an outpatient setting, thinking of like a, a walk-in clinic, or it could be in a hospital as an inpatient or an emergency department settings. And there are other settings too um, that are worth considering. So regardless of the actual approach you use, it's, it's useful to be aware and, and ideally define that um, when sort of considering what, which entries would be eligible to be inputs in an algorithm. Uh, along the notes of, uh, along that idea of uh, data quality and limitations and um, records often need to be sort of transformed or modified in some way since uh, there can be cancellations, corrections, reversals, or duplicate information to do with the data structure. Uh, on that uh, sort of theme, how you define a unique event uh, can be quite important and something that sometimes is not defined, uh, but also it can be defined uh, quite differently depending on your research project. So for instance, a physician visit, if that's one of your inputs, um, how do you handle if a patient sees multiple physicians on the same day? How would that be counted for some projects? Um, that, 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 those visits would just be collapsed into a single visit since you were just interested and someone had like any healthcare contact on a single date. For, for other paper purposes, it would be useful to consider those as separate visits. Uh, again, it's something that could affect um, the results because it would affect enumerating the number of physician visits. It would obviously be more if you considered uh, visits to multiple different physicians on the same date versus if you collapsed across those things. Another consideration is out-of-province care. So if, if patients from Ontario as their home province are like say visiting BC and accessing healthcare there, that can appear on the record. And so it's something to be aware of whether you want to include that information since it's part of like the healthcare utilization in a certain province, or if you want to exclude that because you're focused specifically on residents of sort of the primary province or jurisdiction of, of uh, interest. Uh, so moving more upstream and bigger picture, uh, the bigger picture context, the information that you see in an administrative health record or the data uh, only represents the truth if the recorded diagnosis in a chart does. So if there's a misdiagnosis or if someone, if um, sort of a more generic, less informative diagnosis is given when really a specific one would have been given by a different practitioner or in a different setting, as shown with the example I listed here where, where certain stroke-related diagnostic codes seem to be reported 
uh, slightly differently. So more unspecified ones are used in rural settings versus in urban clinical settings. Um, these are all considerations to, to think about when you when you think about the data that you see uh, that, that it could be influenced by other sort of external or more upstream factors. Another example of which is upcoding, also called opportunistic coding or code creep, which is due to the administrative health data being collected for financial or budgeting reasons. Um, these financial incentives or sort of reimbursement could impact the actual billing pattern or the coding that you see. Um, so an example I've, I've seen in the literature is if a facility's reimbursement was based on case mix complexity, and more complex disease codes may be entered, even if the actual um, case uh, and the complexity was slightly lower than that. Uh, but these can be entered or sort of upcoded to increase complexity and therefore increase uh, reimbursement. Um, so these could be sort of artifacts or sort of patterns in the types of coding you see uh, that are not reflective of the truth necessarily. Another example is a healthcare practitioner fee items where incentives being introduced or, or dropped can in, impact sort of the frequency with which a code is used over time. Between jurisdictions, uh, so between BC and Manitoba in this example, or any province or territory in Canada, and also between countries, there can be quite significant variation in terms of codes used in billing practices. Unfortunately, this example is from quite a long time ago, like over about two decades ago. Uh, but I think the principle that um, that the author identified still rings true today. So they found that uh, between BC and Manitoba, there were some difference in, in the use of um, these specific codes that, that whereby BC physicians were more likely to use a group of sort of generic general symptoms codes as diagnosis um, compared to physicians in Manitoba. So that patterning um, suggests that there probably is a difference in, in the types of codes that are used and sort of their use uh, and, and that could impact results if you were um, focusing on this particular area. But I think the principle is still something to be aware of that when you're comparing even within jurisdictions, but particularly between jurisdictions, different provinces, there are clear um, you know, potential differences that you should uh, look into. And these may not just be differences to like underlying differences, prevalence or incidence in, in, a, in a disease, but could be partly attributed at least to a differential patterns of coding and, and using uh, sort of billing practices. This example is sort of along those lines um, where I've shown this optical illusion uh, where, where two sort of groups, let's say, are trying to estimate uh, a health condition. So in this case, let's say that it's mood and anxiety disorder. Both people are right in this um, setting. So the person on the left says that it's four and the person on the right says it's three. Uh, the numbers don't matter. It's just saying that these two people are, are trying to estimate or capture the same concept, but coming at it from slightly different angles. As you'll see uh, on the left, this is the BC approach, uh, which is um, using a certain set of definitions and criteria. On the right, this is Manitoba's definition or their approach, which differs slightly in the definitions and what they include or don't include. So on the left, uh, in, the Manit in the BC condition, sorry, they include specifically this uh, MSB specific code 50B, which I mentioned earlier, which isn't part of the ICD system. So that wouldn't um, necessarily generalize across uh, Canada. Whereas on the right, this is a Manitoba definition of mood and anxiety disorder, and they have a bit more nuance with ICD codes looking beyond the first three values, as well as considering uh, medication uh, dispensing, things like that. So all to say, uh, the definition you choose can impact um, sort of the results and the concept that you see and how that's manifested. Uh, so something to, to keep in mind with uh, identification algorithms and the inputs. So in addition to the inputs uh, for identification algorithms, I want to talk a little bit more about the time uh, component. So for case finding algorithms, an obvious uh, consideration is the search window. So as I showed earlier with the example with multiple sclerosis, um, th those events had to occur within you know, a 24 month, like two year search window. So this um, can be defined as the period within which diagnostic codes or other health events or inputs need to co-occur. So for that MS example, um, it was five uh, MS related physician visits occurring within a 24 month window. Uh, another point is that if you have standalone or, or one-off events, how that is handled. So. In the MS example, again, there was a single hospitalization 
uh, and that was treated as sort of a one-off like ever and so that's something to consider the same principle could be true for other health events too like physician visits uh, another consideration with time is including a washout period or clearance period this is particularly the case with incidents where it can be necessary to ensure that patients have no prior healthcare interactions or didn't meet the criteria before a uh, certain period, such as your index date or another date of interest. Um, and this can have impacts on the sort of, I guess, diluting the quality of your conclusions and the incidents. You want it to be truly sort of the first of the incident event as much as possible is, is available with immersive data. So having a washout or clearance period and the length of that period is an important consideration with any algorithm. Uh, another piece to do with sort of time uh, and, and sort of the period with which you look back or forward is the look back period. And so this is the, like, the extent to which you look back or sort of retroactively into this person's record um, when you're trying to identify cases. So what's shown in the, in the diagram here on the right is uh, an excerpt from a, a recently published paper by some people, some colleagues of mine at the Center for Excellence. And this showed the impact of uh, different look back periods on the prevalence uh, and incidence of various uh, chronic diseases among people uh, living with HIV. And you can see that um, with when longer look back periods available, there tended to be a higher prevalence uh, of conditions. So something to bear in mind, um, considering people tend to have you know differential uh, length of look back period depending on their age and if they recently moved to the province or territory. So all things to consider uh, since they can impact and, and often does impact uh, the actual results that you'll derive from an algorithm. And a final sort of note on sort of time periods relates to observation period. So when you begin or when do you end uh, a study, like the, the time when you will sort of search for observations uh, and whether any important changes or events that occur during that time. So you can think of cohort effects, policy changes or sort of artifacts of the data quality or coding changes. I think March 2020 will probably be an asterisk on every sort of longitudinal uh, sort of analysis that we ever look at probably in our lifetimes and uh, given how, like, the impact that, that had on so many aspects of life and um, so that's an example of something that would be considered but more subtle changes such as um, sort of policy or fee items being introduced or um, taken out can have impacts as well so all things to, to think about it's important to try to leave no stone unturned and play devil's advocate when you're thinking of you know what could be competing hypotheses for patterns that I see. So to delve into this idea of a search window a little bit more, I'm going to present a, a case study from some work that we've been doing at the center. Uh, so specifically, we're trying to um, estimate uh, some case finding algorithms to identify people living with HIV. And I'll give more details of this in a little bit, but um, broadly speaking, HIV test data was used as the reference or gold standard against which various case finding algorithms were tested. And for several of these algorithms, we assessed co-occurrence of HIV-related HIV physician visits within defined search windows. This is the time frame again within which these events or these physician visits needed to co-occur. So these are the example of three HIV-related physician visits within a one-year period. I will walk through this sort of working example to illustrate this idea of a, a search window. So as you can see here, um, the MSP, so as a reminder, MSP is a HIV-related physician visit comparable to OHIP in Ontario. Um, there were for the, for someone to meet the for, for someone to meet the criteria of an algorithm, they needed to record three MSPs, HIV-related physician visits, within a 365-day period. Um, and in the top example here, this uh, person did so. After them testing positive, they recorded. They had like an event where they recorded three MSPs within a 365 day period. So note this, um, for this example and for this uh, algorithm that we implemented, it doesn't actually matter if they occurred within you know, a, a fiscal year or a calendar year, like they can span uh, you know, multiple sort of the calendar or fiscal years, but as long as the, the events occurred within 365 day period, i.e. Um, the time from the first event to the last event, or the third one in this instance was uh, 365 days or less. So after to discussing that, those search windows, Another example is for these one-off events. So um, for instance, a one-off uh, MSP or a one-off physician visit, how that can be handled. Um, so a simple way that we've done it is, is including if th that event and recording it as sort of meeting the algorithm criteria, if a person ever uh, recorded that event, so it didn't have to co-occur because there were no other events for it to co-occur with. But um, 
we, we just treated it if someone recorded an event anytime for like the time they tested positive, which is sort of our gold standard until the end of their follow-up. So they're treated as ever or at one-off occurring. Um, another consideration is that although search windows are particularly important for case finding algorithms, and that's a clear example, um, it can also be important for other types of identification algorithms. Uh, so for instance, with the hospitalization episodes of care, uh, you can see that um, time can be important. So the time from, uh, or the, this gap, I guess, between someone being discharged and then their new admission, that can be particularly important uh, and is sort of a, a key uh, parameter that can be varied when you're exploring different algorithms. And this is exactly what we've been doing, as well as it, it sort of varying the time or the, the number of days, because we didn't have the specific time information of someone's admission or discharge. We also considered various other different inputs and that's sort of using that information to corroborate or support uh, information uh, available to identify hospitalization episodes of care. And um, so a lot of information here um, but it's just to show people that you know there are 15 different algorithms or definitions that we've considered uh, to try to get at uh, how best to identify hospitalization episodes of care. So moving on to discuss validity evidence of algorithms. Uh, while, while we've talked about all these nuances and the importance of, of using algorithms and some things to consider for inputs, uh, it's important to be able to you know, evaluate the usefulness of an algorithm. So being valid is, is obviously an important thing, but unfortunately, it's, I, I find it's quite often assumed rather than specifically evidenced, or uh, in other words, uh, people will use uh, a measure or an algorithm without um, sort of doing much uh, due diligence with assessing its usefulness in specific contexts. Um, so this is an important consideration, particularly as algorithms and other forms of measures, um, you know, their validity is not a static property, I would argue, but is something embedded within context, as well as something that can vary over time as you know, codes and diagnostic codes and the patterning may have changed over time. So uh, avoiding this off-label use uh, it would be something that I would recommend people to do. So if, if you're, if possible, um, trying to sort of just take an algorithm that's been validated or implemented or used in, another, in one context and then applying that for your own context without at least doing some uh, assessment of its usefulness or the uh, sort of the validity evidence of that can be problematic. So one example is with um, mental illness algorithms related to mental illness in uh, that have been say validated among adult populations. These can then be taken and applied um, without sort of much thought or consideration for pediatric populations uh, when really there needs to be um, some sort of validity evidence or at least uh, efforts to try to validate the algorithm and ensure that they um, sort of have similar usefulness for pediatric populations as they do for adult populations. As I've sort of alluded to and hinted on a little bit um, before, uh, there are different sort of two different components with uh, validity evidence and, and metrics in the context of two binary measures, uh, which is often the case with algorithms. So if you're trying to identify if someone is a case or not a case, or for, instance, for our purpose, if someone was HIV positive or HIV negative, um, there are these two pieces of information that are, are really fundamental. And these form, they're probably familiar two by two table. So the first uh, piece is your gold standard or reference standard. This is sort of the best available resource or information that you have to indicate if someone um, has the disease or has an outcome of interest. And then, and this can be compared to some comparison or a tool, which is basically the thing that you're trying to validate or you know, evaluate and see the usefulness of. So in the example that I'll be showing, and as I've shown a little bit earlier, uh, for our purposes, we had HIV lab tests, which are considered like pretty close to you know, a reference standard, very accurate and useful. And those were used, they served as the reference against which um, and various algorithms, so uh, healthcare related, <coughs> healthcare use related algorithms were used to compare against these HIV lab tests. And um, so the goal was to ensure that we had an algorithm that would accurately classify uh, those like lab confirmed HIV positive persons as truly being HIV positive and vice versa, classifying those lab confirmed HIV negative persons as being HIV negative. This is the two by two table, which I mentioned, which may be familiar to uh, many of you. And um, so there are two sort of com components. So in highlighted in the green is the gold standard classifications. So this is when you're looking sort of down the columns 
And then on the right is the algorithm classification. So looking across the rows, with the gold standard classification, this identifies a person as um, you know, having the disease or not having the disease. Um, sensitivity asks among diseased patients, what, per, what proportion are classified as being diseased by the algorithm? Whereas uh, specificity asks among those without the disease or so non-diseased patients, what percent are classified as non-diseased by the algorithm? And the flip of that is uh, the algorithm classification, which um, will we'll consider the, the denominator to be all people who sort of tested um, or, or, or were classified as either having the condition or not having the condition. So uh, the positive predictive value asks among patients classified as diseased by the algorithm, what proportion are truly diseased? Whereas negative predictive value asks among patients classified as non-diseased by the algorithm, what proportion are truly non-diseased? Ideally, we'd have absolute agreement and there wouldn't be any need to sort of do any more work, but oftentimes you do have um, sort of discordance between these two measures and hence you have false positives or false negatives. So with our case finding algorithm and our sort of case study, uh, our goal was to assess the validity of this case finding algorithm for HIV using a validation subsample. So those are people who had this gold standard of HIV lab tests, as well as algorithm, uh, or, so, as well as sort of algorithms that could be applied, i.e. they had healthcare record information. So our algorithm for the purpose of the example is three HIV related physician visits occurring within a one year period. The information um, for this val validation subsample came from BCCDC uh, HIV lab test results, as well as from traditional healthcare, healthcare records. So MSP, which are physician visits, and the DAD, which is hospitalization records. And this is part of um, a Stop HIV AIDS study, uh, which is um, an evaluation of this program. And you can see information um, below and it's sort of identifying uh, HIV cases uh, is sort of an important goal of this program. So I encourage you to click on the link and um, look into that if you're interested more about this uh, particular program. So coming back to the two by two table, um, what I've done here is sort of plot some uh, sort of fabricated values to illustrate the concept. So focusing on the red cells, um, if you look, there were 10,000 observations. And uh, uh, so these are 10,000 people who were classified as HIV positive. So they had, they were sort of had the disease uh, and of which um, of this 10,000, 9,000 uh, were classified as uh, HIV positive based on the algorithm. So you could say that the sensitivity was 90%. And on the right hand side, uh, this looks at sort of the complement of that. So of the people who were HIV negative, um, specificity was calculated by um, dividing the number of true negative cases, which is 9,900 by all the observations. So the specificity value here uh, was shown as <coughs> being 99%. So these are true sort of, I guess, um, standard measure measures that are used in uh, assessing validity of, of metrics and particularly algorithms when you have uh, binary measures. In addition to the sensitivity and specificity, there are like many, many other measures. Uh, you could probably give a few talks just about the different measures that are available. I encourage you to look into that um, if you're interested in the different measures that are available. One is a uh, concordance statistic, which is sort of a balanced measure, which considers both elements um, and another uh, sort of set of, of metrics or known as predictive value. So positive predictive value and negative predictive value, uh, which are commonly reported. But for them to be uh, accurately interpreted, they do assume and they do require that the prevalence of the condition of the disease of interest uh, was comparable to the general population, which can clearly, um, for our case, that wasn't a um, scenario, since this was a validation subsample of people with HIV lab tests and all of the people eventually tested positive. So for our work, we've not been um, estimating PPV or NPV. And this is in line with another um, study on HIV case finding algorithms um, that had a similarly sort of higher prevalence of HIV in the validation subsample than the general population. And similarly, they did not report these um, prevalence dependent uh, metrics. So with sensitivity and specificity, there's often a bit of a trade-off, unfortunately. Um, so ideally we would have you know, perfect sensitivity and per perfect uh, specificity. So false negatives would be minimized uh, and false positives would be minimized. But um, if you have a, an algorithm or a measure that's you know, very focused on being sensitive and very effective at doing that, 
it tends to come at the cost of a little bit less, like lower specificity and vice versa. So uh, this is like an important consideration uh, when thinking of sort of validity uh, metrics and what things are important and, and what can be most applicable for your purposes. And it really depends on, on the goal of your analysis and, and project and why you'd want to use the uh, case finding algorithm. Uh, just to illustrate that um, idea, I've plotted uh, sort of a dynamic graph here showing uh, each dot, which represents uh, each algorithm. So this is from uh, publication, you can see at the bottom. So you can see there's this trade-off where we have a bit of a clustering of uh, algorithms at, at the top here, which have uh, high specificity. So they have very, very few false positives, but they have, uh, let's say, a moderate proportion of false negatives. Whereas uh, on the bottom right, there's one algorithm which has very high sensitivity. So the only one with over 90% sensitivity, but that came at the cost of lower specificity. So this balance between so very strict algorithms and very lenient algorithms, oftentimes people will um, you know, perhaps prioritize one element over the other. So perhaps prioritize specificity over sensitivity, uh, depending on their goals. Uh, in the context of rare diseases, there's quite an interesting um, thought experiment and sort of illustration of the importance of specificity and, and really the cost of, of decreasing specificity uh, uh, to the actual numbers of false positives we identified. So uh, in this Antonio paper, which uh, was sort of focused on an HIV case finding algorithm, he presents the example of if you imagine 5,000 HIV positive persons in a population of 1 million residents, uh, for each 1% drop in specificity, that would um, yield an additional approximately 10,000 HIV negative persons who'd be misclassified as being HIV positive, i.e. false positives. Whereas for each 1% drop in sensitivity, an additional approximately 50 uh, HIV positive persons would be misclassified as being HIV negative. So you can see the impact on specificity for sort of uh, decreasing the, the, the level of specificity is much more severe in terms of misclassification of false positives than the corresponding 1% decrease in sensitivity. There's an interesting website you can uh, look onto and it allows you to sort of plot different um, metrics and, and sort of vary the parameters related to algorithms, so sensitivity, specificity, prevalence, and the sample size. Uh, and I've plotted these values here so you can see um, starting from 100% specificity going down to 90%, which you know could still be considered you know reasonably high. Each 1% drop adds like a large number of uh, false positives when um, you're looking at a rare disease. So each 1% drop adds about 10,000 false positives. So um, something really to be aware of. And if you want to sort of prioritize specificity, which is the case for our uh, particular uh, research project and validation study, um, it's, it's a useful reminder of sort of the impact of each you know, 1%, even just a 1% decrease in specificity adds um, you know, a large, like several thousand false positives. Um, so another point on validation metrics is eligibility. So this is, I guess, determining who would be included in the equation and in the denominator for sensitivity or specificity estimates. And how, the type of inclusion criteria you set um, can have you know, a sizable impact on uh, sort of the estimates for these validity metrics, as well as uh, sort of the usefulness of um, you know, inferring information from that uh, particular set of results. So as you'll see, if, if you're familiar with administrative health data uh, work, like an algorithm validation studies, people sometimes require participants in the analysis to be recent healthcare users. This is sometimes uh, a function of the, the nature of the validation subsample, which can be from EMR records. Um, so or, or patients who are rostered to a physician in a certain clinic or a set of clinics. So by virtue of being that, they may differ a little bit from the general population. Uh, and this can vary depending on like a particular subpopulation, uh, but something to be to, to be aware of, like how you define your eligibility criteria and who you actually would include in calculations of you know, specificity and sensitivity and how it can impact other estimates. For our case, we required a one year minimum follow-up, so basically be present and alive in BC for at least one year uh, after the HIV positive test. And this had a little impact on specificity, but some impacts on sensitivity since it helps reducing um, false negatives and people who were um, you know, present for a very short time in BC before leaving, they would be removed. So then that helps to improve um, sensitivity. 
<coughs> so this is just an illustration of uh, this sort of eligibility or, or um, inclusion criteria that we've decided on. So um, for people who uh, for people to be considered eligible for the sensitivity calculation, they had to be uh, present for at least one year. So they've then formed part of the denominator for the sensitivity calculation. And the complement to that for the specificity calculation, if they were present for at least one year before the HIV negative test, then they would be included in their calculation for specificity. So moving on to the final section, uh, which focuses on reporting and applying algorithms. Um, I've included some information here, which I think is, is useful to bear in mind for reporting results. Uh, I think the, the broad sort of guiding principle um, is, is clarity and transparency, uh, regardless of the specific methods you choose or assumptions that you have or, or how you define algorithms. Describing them clearly and in a transparent way is like paramount, I, I would argue. So like creating some protocol or, or recipe or sort of clear description of what you did and how you did it uh, is, is particularly important, I would say. Uh, there are a few guidelines that sort of can help inform and structure uh, and sort of guide your approach to, to reporting algorithms. And it can also help you uh, effectively evaluate algorithms from other studies. So the record, uh, as the citation is presented here, this is a, one that's uh, quite widely used um, and specific to diagnostic accuracy and, and validating algorithms with administrative health data. Um, there's a paper by Benchimo et al, which um, builds on the STARD, the STARD, uh, approach uh, and adapts it to administrative health data. So in their paper, they uh, provide various recommendations specific to uh, conducting and reporting validity studies with administrative health data, and they prevent a few. They provide a few different um, suggestions uh, and ideas to consider with um, you know looking through validity studies and how you can best implement them. Um, in their appendix, they have this checklist um, which is useful for understanding uh, <coughs> the information that can be used in a validity study so uh, in algorithms uh, that are used like which uh, you know assumptions are made or not made what types of measures are reported so they use this when they were evaluating studies that have been published and then like implemented uh, but it can also be used they're useful as a, a guideline when you're constructing your own algorithm validation study so just to finish, I've listed a few considerations uh, when reporting identification algorithms and uh, I think you can find useful. So some of this overlaps with uh, what was just mentioned in those guideline documents uh, publications, uh, but things that we sort of picked up in our own team and that we think um, can be beneficial as sort of a general guiding principle. So the first one would be uh, when reporting validity results uh, to provide the N, so the cont as well as the proportion for false positive true positive, false negative, and true negative. And um, it can help uh, keep things more transparent for the reader and allow them to actually calculate various different other metrics uh, beyond those that you reported, just from these four ones, uh, particularly if prevalence is also provided. Uh, examining and characterizing these false cases, this is something I find very interesting. Uh, so in, in some publications, such as the, the one linked at the bottom here, um, they actually explored uh, the false positives and the false negatives that were generated. Uh, after applying a, uh, a case finding algorithm to try to see, okay, there are there certain lessons that can be learned for why certain people were classified as a false positive or a false negative. Uh, and that was quite inform um, informative for me <coughs> uh, and it can help the sort of the reader understand uh, the performance of the algorithm and certain context specific uh, considerations. Also providing multiple metrics uh, as well as their 95% confidence intervals can be useful as this includes PPV, uh, NPV, and if the cohort prevalence is you know, somewhat comparable to the general population, then you know, PPV and NPV could be reported uh, appropriately. Along those lines, estimating the prevalence of the outcome in the validation subsample, as well as in your target population, if that was like an entire province or whatever uh, target population it was, that can be useful and help sort of give, uh, give the reader context. Additionally, uh, providing you know, a set of different algorithm options, um, such as sort of high sensitivity, balanced ones, and so forth. Uh, this is a useful idea because, um, as we've mentioned, as I mentioned throughout the talk, uh, each sort of decision made should um, come back to the specific goals of an analysis or a research project. And um, so providing different options and sort of, I guess, different candidates that were considered is useful. And you can also sort of show the, the impacts of implementing those algorithms. So, 
shown in the graph here. This um, illustrates the differences in prevalence over time, depending on the type of algorithm um, that you would choose. And these algorithms would vary according to sort of some would be more um, focused on sensitivity or according to their focus on specificity and so on. And a sixth recommendation or consideration I would uh, put forth relates to operationalizing the details of the identification algorithm, like very clearly. So all the things that I've talked about um, today, diagnostic codes, how you use them, uh, the versioning. So like if you used ICD-10 or ICD-10CA, there could be some differences or jurisdiction specific codes if they were used. Uh, the typing of the diagnostic codes, if you subset just to physicians, for instance, or if you included other healthcare practitioners, that's an important thing to consider how the actual codes were queried, uh, whether you just looked at like the individual code or all codes beginning with that. Um, and, and also the search window. So this would relate to events occurring uh, within a calendar or fiscal year, if that was your, your particular purpose, or if you use this more co-occurring approach, which is what we did. So events had to co-occur within a certain number of months or years of each other. And also how you handled one-off events, such as like a single hospitalization or a physician visit. Another consideration I'd have is that for the sake of transparency and sort of helping other people learn uh, and, and sort of showing the process that were used for the algorithms, providing the code and macros or functions or, or whatever sort of ingredients that were used um, to actually construct the the, um, the algorithms and how those were you know, tested if applicable, that can be useful. Sometimes this isn't possible depending on certain um, you know, proprietary licenses and things like that, but I think it's a, it's a good um, sort of step forward for transparency to provide this information, even as an appendix or something like that when recording on results uh, for identification algorithms. Uh, the final few considerations, um, relate to sort of describing and, and better uh, contextualizing the validation subsample, how it compares, how it's similar or different to your target population. This really helps with um, you know, identifying potential biases, such as selection bias or generalizability. And it's just generally more useful for the reader to give them context and allows them to evaluate um, the study uh, and the results from it more accurately and seeing how appropriate it would be to then apply that to their own context. Uh, additionally, uh, where possible, I think data visualization is like particularly useful. Um, so I think rather than you know, only listing results in a dense table, plotting them uh, and sort of stratifying by different groups and um, sort of spending a bit of time to explore and identify different patterns of, of findings and, trend, and trends could be particularly important um, and help sort of identify patterns that may not be as obvious there if you just look through a, a, a table, for instance. And the final consideration I'd have is that perhaps the most important one is to uh, contextualize and caveat the application of algorithms. So uh, performance of an algorithm will depend on the context. Um, so if you if you were perform using the algorithm on a subset of population who had a lot of healthcare use or like were high use of healthcare, that could probably perform differently than uh, other groups who per perhaps are l um, lower users of healthcare use. So would be less likely to use healthcare and therefore maybe less likely to sort of trigger or meet the algorithm. Um, this is an important thing to consider, particularly yeah, with, with the, the implications of that. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, I hope this has been useful for people. I'm, I appreciate we're sh uh, running short on time, but I'm happy to connect uh, by email or afterwards. If anyone has any questions or discussion points or you know lessons learned from their own context with identification algorithms, um, I'd be great to hear that. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. Thanks again, Scott, for, for presenting. Thanks so much for all your resources that you provided. I look forward to hearing more. That's good. Thanks okay. very much. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Bye, Bye for now.